What is an inner product space? Here's the definition. An inner product space is a vector space that has an inner product, so we need to describe what an inner product is. But first, let's talk about what an inner product does for us. An inner product is useful for defining distances and angles in a vector space. It is exactly the structure we need to do that. Distances and angles are very important in certain applications. We'll explore such applications later in this video, but let's first describe what is an inner product. An inner product on a vector space is a function which assigns to each pair of vectors u and v in the vector space a number denoted by this bracket notation that satisfies the following properties. For all u, v, and w in the vector space in all scalars c, 1, the inner product of u and v is equal to the inner product of v with u. In other words, you can switch order. And we call this property commutivity, or the commutative property. u plus v inner product with w is equal to u inner product with w plus v inner product with w. You can think of this as a distributive property where you can distribute the w to the u and the v as you would do in multiplication. We call this additivity. 3. The inner product of cu and w is equal to c times the inner product of u and w. In other words, you can pull the c out in front, and we call this homogeneity. We say the inner product is homogeneous. 4. The inner product of v with itself is always greater than 0 for all non-zero vectors v in the vector space. This is called positive definiteness. These are the four properties that an inner product must satisfy. I just want to point out that property 1 for complex vector spaces is replaced by u, v, the inner product of u and v, is equal to the complex conjugate of the inner product of v and u. That is, when you switch order, you have to take the complex conjugate. So try this. Show that the inner product of the zero vector with itself is equal to zero. Here's a hint. Use property 3. So put this on pause. We'll check answers together. So here we go. Note that the zero vector can always be written as zero times itself. That is a scalar zero times the zero vector. And thus, you can write zero inner product with zero as zero times zero inner product with zero. By property three, we can pull the zero out in front and write this as zero times the inner product of zero with zero, which equals zero. Here's an example of an inner product space. Let our vector space just be Rn, and let the inner product be defined by inner product of u and v is u dot v. In other words, inner product is just the dot product. In order to demonstrate that this is an inner product, we need to verify properties 1 through 4. Property 1, our commutivity property, let's see what that says. u inner product with v is u dot v, and that's equal to v dot u by properties of the dot product, and that's equal to v inner product with u and therefore commutivity holds. 2. Inner product of u plus v and w, that's equal to the dot product of u plus v and w. By properties of the dot product, we can distribute the w to the u and the v. And this becomes u dot w plus v dot w, and that's just inner product of u and w plus inner product of v and w. 3. Inner product of c, u, and v. I've just written the whole thing out here. We can pull the c out in front of the dot product and therefore in front of the inner product, and also inner product of u with itself is just the dot product of u with itself. That's the length of u squared, and that's greater than zero for any non-zero vector u in Rn. 
Therefore, all of our required properties are true, and this is indeed an inner product. Here's an important example of an inner product space, possibly the most important example. Let v be the continuous functions on an interval a, b on the real line, real value continuous functions. And we've already discussed that this is a vector space. Now, why is this an inner product space? We have to define first what the inner product means. First, let me point out that for functions, we typically just write the function letter without arrows on top. Here's the definition of inner product on the vector space of continuous functions. The inner product of f and g is equal to the integral from a to b of f of x times g of x. Recall that you can always integrate a continuous function, and if f is continuous and g is continuous, then f of x times g of x is continuous. So this definition definitely makes sense question is, why is it an inner product? So to demonstrate that it's an inner product, we have to verify our four properties. Let's go through them. Property 1. The inner product of f and g is defined to be the integral from a to b of f of x times g of x dx. By the commutative property of multiplication, you can switch the order of g and f and write that as the integral from a to b g of x times f of x dx and that's just the inner product of g and f. Two, inner product of f plus g with another function h. Write that out in terms of the integral that's equal to integral from a to b of f of x plus g of x quantity times h of x dx and by the distributive property of multiplication over addition you can distribute the h to f and g and write that as the integral from a to b of f of x times h of x plus g of x times h of x dx now we can break up the integral into two integrals. First from a to b, f of x times h of x plus integral from a to b, g of x times h of x. And that's just the inner product of f with h plus the inner product of g with h. Three, the inner product of cf with g Writing this out, it's the integral from a to b of c times f of x times g of x. And because the integral is homogeneous, we can always pull out a constant and write that as c times the integral of f of x times g of x. And so that's equal to c times the inner product of f and g. And property four the inner product of f with itself equals the integral from a to b of f of x times f of x. And this is the integral from a to b of the function f of x squared dx. And if f is not the zero function, then the square of f has to be positive at some point p in the interval. What does this mean graphically? It means that the graph of f squared is above the horizontal axis on an interval around p. And therefore, there is some area, some positive area, under that graph. This means that the integral of f squared on that small interval must be positive, since the graph of f squared never dips below zero on the entire interval a, b. The integral over a, b must be positive. So we've proven properties 1, 2, 3, and we just proved 4 by showing that that integral is greater than 0, if f is not the 0 function. Note that lengths and distances in Rn can be defined using the dot product. So let u be the vector u1 down to un, v the vector v1 down to vn. 
the length of u denoted by these double bars is just equal to u dot u to the one-half power. Writing that out in terms of the components of u, that's just the components of u squared and added together taken to the one-half power. The distance from u to v is just the length of u minus v and that's u minus v dotted into itself to the one-half power. And we can write this out in terms of the components of u and v. It's u1 minus v1 squared all the way down to un minus vn squared. Add up these terms and take the square root. The cosine of the angle from u to v is equal to the dot product of u and v divided by the length of u times the length of v. When that angle is 90 degrees, the cosine is 0. So we say that u is perpendicular to v precisely when u dot v is equal to 0. This gives us an algebraic way of describing when two vectors are perpendicular. Analogously, in an inner product space, we define the length of a vector using the same double bar notation we used above as the inner product of u with itself and then the positive square root of that. The distance between two vectors, u and v, is simply the length of u minus v. And this can be written out in terms of the inner product explicitly. It's u minus v, inner product with itself. And we take the square root. The cosine of the angle between u and v is defined as above. In other words, it's equal to the inner product of u and v divided by the length of u times the length of v. We say that u is perpendicular or orthogonal to v precisely when the inner product of u and v is equal to zero. Here's a good exercise to try on your own. Using the properties of inner product, prove that if u is orthogonal to v, then the square of the length of u plus v is equal to the square of the length of u plus the square of the length of v. This is the generalization of the Pythagorean theorem to inner product spaces. So the solution is assuming that u and v are orthogonal. Let's write out the expression the square of the length of u plus v. That's u plus v inner product with itself. Now we're going to use the properties of inner product first to distribute the right hand u plus v to u and v so we get u inner product with u plus v plus v inner product with u plus v. And here we use the additivity property. Now we can switch the order using commutivity and distribute again from the right to get u inner product with u plus v inner product with u plus the inner product of u and v plus the inner product of v and v. But the inner product of u and v is equal to zero and the inner product of v and u can be switched around to u and v inner product of u and v and that's equal to zero. So again, we use additivity here and the orthogonality assumed for u and v. So this is the square of, of the length of u plus the square of the length of v. This completes the proof of the identity. Why do we call this the Pythagorean theorem? Here's a picture of u 
and with v perpendicular to u, orthogonal to u. Here's the vector u plus v. And so we have a right triangle, and one of the legs of the right triangle is u. We'll label that a, length a. v is length v. u plus v is length c. And we just proved that c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared, the Pythagorean theorem. So this is the generalization of the Pythagorean theorem to inner product spaces. So for example, let v be this space of continuous functions on the interval 0 to 2 pi. f of x, let's set that equal to cosine x, g of x, let that be sine x. The length of f squared equals the inner product of f with itself. We can write that out in terms of the definition of inner product. That's just the integral from 0 to 2 pi of cosine times cosine. So it's integral from 0 to 2 pi cosine squared. And using the identity cosine squared is equal to 1 plus cosine 2x over 2. We can now easily find the antiderivative. That's going to be 1 half times x plus 1 half sine 2x. We have to evaluate that from 0 to 2 pi. The sine 2x term ends up giving us 0, and therefore this whole integral is equal to pi. In a similar way, it's easy to show that the square of the length of g is also equal to pi. Let's look at the inner product of f and g. That's the integral from a to b, or 0 to 2 pi in this case. f of x, g of x. Integral from 0 to 2 pi. Cosine x times sine x. Integral from 0 to 2 pi. 1 half sine 2x using one of our trig identities. This is easy to find the antiderivative. This is 1 half times negative 1 half cosine 2x evaluated from 0 to 2 pi. And this just ends up giving us 0. Thus, f is orthogonal to g. Therefore, the Pythagorean theorem applies. In other words, f plus g, its length squared, is equal to the square of the length of f plus the square of the length of g. Well, we figured out the right-hand side there. Both these terms are pi. Therefore, this whole thing has got to e equal 2 pi. So let's check this directly. Let's go ahead and compute the square of the length of f plus g. That's just the inner product of f plus g times f plus g. That's the integral from 0 to 2 pi of cosine x plus sine x squared. And multiplying this out, we get the integral from 0 to 2 pi of cosine squared x plus sine squared x plus 2 cosine x sine x. Well, cosine squared plus sine squared is just equal to 1. And this other term integrates to 0, as we showed above. Therefore, this expression reduces to the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 dx, and that's equal to 2 pi, as it should be. What's the significance of inner product spaces? Why are they important? So here's an example from communication engineering. Messages such as text messages, telephone calls, emails, encrypted communications between military units are often transmitted through the air as electromagnetic signals. These signals can be thought of as continuous functions of time, where E is the strength of the electromagnetic field. 
and t is time usually confined to a very short interval that we'll call a b. Here's a simple example of using signals to communicate. Suppose there's three messages that you want to send. Everything is okay, there's a problem, help, and the third message, stand by for more information. Here's an example of what the signals that communicate these messages might look like. Here's a graph of our first hypothetical signal. Looks kind of like a sine wave, so this signal would communicate everything is okay. Here's a graph of the second signal. It rises and then falls. This communicates there's a problem. Third signal. It falls and rises. This communicates standby for more info. Now those are the transmitted signals. They have to go through the airwaves and in doing so they get corrupted by noise. So the received signals don't quite look the same. Here's an example of what the first received signal might look like. It kind of has the same shape but it's got a lot of static added to it and that's the noise that gets added. And here's the other two signals. You can see that the received signals have some of the qualitative features of the transmitted signals but they're not exactly the same. They've been corrupted by noise the job of the receiver is to distinguish between these received signals even though they've been corrupted. For example, if the top received signal arrives, then if it's not too corrupted by noise, the receiver will decide that that corresponds to the first message, everything is okay. If the bottom signal arrives, provided it's not too corrupted by noise, the receiver will decide that that's corresponding to the signal, stand by for more info. This is not such an easy task because there's an infinite variety of received signals that are possible. And this is where inner product helps us. In particular, since our signal space is an inner product space, we can think of signals, both transmitted and received, as points in a vector space separated by fixed distances. So we have a concept of distance here. Let's label our first transmitted signal S sub 1 of t, the second signal S sub 2 of t, and the third signal, s sub 3 of t. Let's represent these signals as points in a space. We'll diagram that on the left here. These are the transmitted signals separated by certain fixed distances, s1, s2, and s3. And again, we can measure these distances because we do have a concept of distance given by our inner product on the space of continuous functions. Let's diagram the transmission process. The signals travel through the air and as they do so, noise is added. Again, the exact details of the noise are unpredictable and complicated. However, using the concept of distance in signal space, there's a simple way to understand the effect of noise on the received signals. In particular, noise typically moves each signal from its original position to a new position that is within a certain radius of the original signal. In other words, each transmitted signal has a small region around it where the received signal will likely fall. We'll call this the likely region of the received signal. Occasionally, the received signal will fall outside of this region, in which case the receiver will make a mistake. Shortly, we'll discuss how engineers minimize the chance of this happening. The radius of the likely region of the received signal depends on the strength of the noise, that is the noise power. Even though the noise signal is unpredictable, the noise power is usually predictable and measurable. Therefore, the radius is known ahead of time. This allows the receiver to usually pick out the correct message from the received signal. An important part of the design of a communication system is coding, which is the process of assigning signals to messages. So good codes spread out signals in signal space by as much distance as possible. So this would be an example of a good code where the likely regions of the received signals don't overlap. Non-overlapping regions allow the receiver to reliably pick out which message was sent based on the received signal. Codes that aren't so good cluster certain signals in the same vicinity of signal space. So here's an example. Again, we have three signals, but this time two of the signals, signals two and three, are separated by a very small distance. Signal one is no problem. Its likely region does not overlap with the other two. But signals two and three 
have overlapping likely regions. Therefore, signals 2 and 3 will often be confused by the receiver. And what this means is that the receiver will often make a false determination as to whether message 2 or message 3 was sent. I'll conclude this video by talking about some of the challenges of creating good codes. First of all, there are often not three messages, but billions, trillions, or even more messages that need to be spread out in signal space. So this requires quite a bit of mathematical machinery to make sure that all these myriad signals are separated by as much distance as possible. And two, received signals must be efficiently decoded by the receiver, and this is a much more mathematically challenging problem. In particular, the receiver has to very quickly analyze the signal and decide which likely region it belongs to. For most communication systems, this requires a great deal of computer processing power because of the extraordinary number of possible messages. So a historical note, until the 1980s, computers powerful enough to do fast decoding were heavy, big, and expensive. And it was certainly not practical for a person to carry a computer like that around with them. This explains why there were no widely used consumer cell phones until the 1980s. Even though the mathematics and engineering of cell phones had been known for many decades by that point, in fact, there were bulky and expensive prototypes that had been deployed in various countries way before the 1980s. These were not handheld and had to be carried around in cars or trucks or ships. The point is that the mathematics and engineering of cell phones had to wait till the technology caught up in order to have cheap enough and small enough phones for a consumer market.